Hey, hello, hello, welcome. Some things never change, right? Here we go again with, I mean, literally, some things never change, right? you think I would put on a different t-shirt. We have a new lesson today, and it is an extension of the previous lesson, but it's slightly more complicated, of course, but you have the skills to conquer this. Now, what are you going to conquer here? You are going to conquer the following. I want you to uh, I want you to look at a three hinged arch that is asymmetric and there is a kink on one of the sides of the arch. It is a moment carrying kink. So the piece itself, make your knuckles really, really stiff and push on your fingers. The knuckles carry bending or rotational restraint. So use your elbow, I use the term elbow. Push on your wrist, but lock your elbow really tight. Tight, tight, tight. That is what I mean, it's called rigid. That doesn't mean fixed. Fixed means it, it is fixed in space and my own architectural engineering students get that term wrong. Rigid means it does not change shape. It certainly changes position. It certainly rotates in three-dimensional space or here in two-dimensional space, but it carries bending, okay? It is not an internal hinge. The crown is established as always, and we have that kink, like I said, in, in the knuckle or in the elbow, whatever anthropomorphic image you would like to use. We have some load somewhere. It doesn't matter what the load is. It doesn't matter what the direction the law of the load is. Here I have a load going down on one side of the arch. Now let's think about this as designers again. I am prescribing these key points, these, these very important points. For instance, the crown. This elbow might be necessitated by some kind of program. So imagine again, some kind of seats here, maybe there's a stage here, right? And we have equipment behind the stage and, and there's a screen and people are watching the, the action on, on the stage. And, and there's a set, there's a set that's built up like in our own uh, Shakespeare festival, which I just attended last weekend, an outdoor set was built for uh, the Central Coast Shakespeare Festival. Congratulations. So this height here might be prescribed architecturally. Here I made it very large, 25 meters, way up there. The crown is even higher. Maybe there's some lighting up there, right? And then the rest of it is seating. So it's a fairly large theater, let's say. Now, this joint would be prefabricated in a shop, in a factory, and shipped to the site. Then it might be welded or bolted to the other members. These are very long members, so we would probably have to connect them in the field, so-called field splicing or field welding, as opposed to shop welding. The shop would make that elbow because it's a weird angle, right? 159 degrees, you know, that's a strange angle. They might say, what on earth are you asking me to do? But as I said before, you could either pick the lengths of the segment and then you end up with the key points being wherever they are, or you pick the key points of the segments and then the lengths end up being whatever they are. In one case, you know, you're thinking like a builder and the other case, you're thinking like a designer. I think that's a great image. So you could prescribe the angle at that elbow if you want, but I'm assuming my shop 
factory crew can do anything. And I said 159.78 degrees. And I just put that on just to make them crazy, right? Okay, now to make things even more challenging, I am asking you for a specific moment. Guess where I want that moment to be? And yes, maybe you read the text or you guessed fantastically. And the answer is I want it at that elbow, right? That rigid elbow or rigid knuckle. Why would I want that? I am designing that, making sure it's strong enough and stiff enough that it can survive the loads of the lighting, of the speakers, et cetera, et cetera, that are hanging off of this structure. Okay, so I think that's a great preface to a, a very interesting, I think, design challenge, right? We never call them problems. They are etudes or design challenges. Now I will make your heads hurt again, even if you're an engineering student, I think your head might hurt here a little bit. So get some, get some napkins, some napkins, get ready. You might have to wipe the sweat off your brow. Suppose the arch had two straight pieces as before in the previous lesson. If we load up one side of the arch and not the other, there is no bending on the unloaded side. There is no bending. And boy, it seems like there really should be bending there, right? You know, you could imagine in your mind's eye, the right side going down, the left side going up, it's groaning and then what's happening here? I don't like asymmetric loads. But the moment is not present at all on the left side. There's a really good reason for that algebraically, but graphically, I think the answer is much more visual. When we loft the perturbed configuration, we see that the work done on one side or the other side is dependent on those lofts and those lofts go to zero if we cut the left side and we made delta small very very small all the lofts would be zero on the right side where the load is I could prove that to you. I think I proved it to you in a, in a different lesson. Uh, maybe the lesson that we just had, 11A. This is uh, the new lesson. Now, that wasn't the head exploding part, so now get your towels ready. Here we go. Here we go. If we had an elbow or a knuckle on the left side, the same arch, the same loading condition, it's only loaded on the right side, the moment is not zero here. That's the head exploding part. Now, what is going on? What is going on is a fantastic story. It is in the first book on graphic statics, um, which is based on funiculars. So this is beyond the scope of this course. You are not responsible for this slide and this course, but I just can't help but tell you a piece of that story, go buy the first book. Uh, if you're, if you're super interested in funiculars, the further you are from the funicular on your architecture, the more bending you have. So I drew the bending, uh, as solid, uh, triangles or shaded triangles on the lower part of the screen. And I have images on the upper side of the screen that show the funicular or so the so-called line of action that a chain would assume under those loads, a hanging chain. We freeze the chain, we invert it, and we have this funicular. This is an idea that is very, very rich that master designers used. We won't use this idea at all. I just wanted to show you and make your head 
explode. This is what we will be studying. So we're not talking about funiculars. We're talking about an asymmetrically loaded arch. We have the key points, the left support, that elbow or that knuckle or that corner, C1, the crown and the right support. And we have some loads and it doesn't matter where the loads are, but I want to keep the loads only on the right side of the arch. Having neat, tidy numbers for my key points necessitates clunky numbers for my segment lengths and for that angle of the corner. The segments are what they are. So we live with that. Notice the spans here. This is a grand space. If these are meters, it's a 60 meter span. Very, very large, uh, more than half of a soccer field. And we will design a soccer field later in the course. So stick around. Now, how do I get the perturbed shape? The perturbed shape is always based on chords. Chords are your friends. You can establish chords as the shortest line from a axis of rotation to a point that rotates about that axis of rotation. If the segments are straight, the chords coincide with the segments. So for instance, what is the chord length to the first elbow or first knuckle? Uh, we call that C1. Well, it happens to be segment one. It's 32.02 meters, but you don't really need that number. What you need to do is draw a circle centered on the left support, passing through the corner, through that point C1. And the new elbow, C1 prime, will be somewhere on that circular path. Easy peasy, mac and cheesy. Now, just like in the previous lesson, I'm going to ask you to pause. I'm going to ask you to seriously pause and say, what is the next step? Because if you get the next step, you're done. You could turn off this video and you can go work on your etude. But if you don't know this next step, you need to stick around and watch me. But we've done this next step many, many times. What is the next step? I am pausing. The next step is to find the crown prime, the perturbed crown. How do we do that? Through the intersection of two circles. What two circles? A circle centered on the new knuckle or the new elbow. And that length or that radius, excuse me, of that circle is the second segment. The segment from the knuckle to the crown. That's one circle. The other circle is centered on the right support. Its radius is the segment on the right. So here we go. I drew those two circles. You could see it centered on C1 prime and you could see it centered on right. And C1 prime is way out there, way perturbed. And those circles do not intersect. That's okay. Just wiggle it, move it until they intersect. Your machine is not infinitely malleable. We said that before. But, there's something else that has to happen. And that something is that we need to monitor the delta. We need to monitor the delta. And since I cracked the knuckle at C1 prime, I am not maintaining that angle at 159.78 degrees. And that's a problem, but that's okay because I am investigating the moment at the knuckle. If I were investigating the moment somewhere else, I would have to maintain the integrity of that angle. 
I hope that's okay, but I purposely chose <clears throat> this, this example with a prescribed cut point so that it is completely analogous to the previous lesson where you looked at the angle on either side of the cut point. And the cut point here is at C1, at that elbow. So I wiggle these around until the circles intersect. Obviously, there are two such intersections. I hide the spurious point. I rename the intersecting point that remains as crown prime. And I prove to myself that the segments have not elongated. Segment two in the unperturbed arch is exactly the same as segment two in the perturbed arch. Segment three in the unperturbed arch is exactly the same as segment three in the perturbed arch. What is not the same is the angle in the elbow in the perturbed shape at C1 prime. So let's pause once again and think about what does that angle really mean? More importantly, what does that angle not mean? Maybe that's even a better prompt. What isn't that angle? I don't know if that was a great prompt or not. Okay, did you get the answer? Congratulations if you did. That angle is not delta. Let me repeat, that angle is not delta. Delta is the difference between those two angles. Think about it when it was a flat, straight stick. Delta is the difference between the two. When there's no difference, it's flat and straight. It's not saying that delta is 180 degrees between the two sticks, right? It's saying, no, the difference is zero. That's really important. Get that into your head, okay? Don't worry about radians. The robot knows that you want radians, even if you're displaying it in degrees. And we think like the drunken sailor who invented 360 degrees, right? That's the way we think. We don't think in 2 pi. We think in 360. Why 360? That proves that that person was drunk. Okay, so here I have a large delta, 28 degrees, and you could see that it is the difference between the angle at the original elbow or knuckle and the perturbed elbow or knuckle. And when delta becomes zero, watch what happens. Watch what happens. We approach truth with a capital T because the lofts the lofts are established. Now, which way is the loft going here? The loft on the right side is going down. The load is going down. That is positive work. When I bring it over to the other side of the equation, it becomes negative. I divide by delta and I get my unknown moment. So where is that perturbation? Where is that perturbation? I need to establish the load point on the perturbed structure. So uh, I mentioned that it's going down. You could see it. A really fast way of doing it is just drawing a circle centered on the right support, passing through the original load point. That's really quick. I do not need to march along that length to establish the radius of the circle. I'll show you how to do that in our program GeoGebra. <clears throat> you could use the scalar length, but it's much quicker to just use the circle. And then get that loft. That loft is vertical because my load is vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, if my load was horizontal, I would be seeking the horizontal loft. The signs matter, the directions matter. So what is the moment? That moment is that loft multiplied by that force with a negative sign divided by delta, which is in radians, and the robot knows that you want radians, not degrees. You could do this 
loft calculation algebraically if you want. It's simply the difference in the y value of load point one uh, versus the y value of load point one prime. Or you could do it geometrically by drawing a little segment and referring to that segment as the loft. Here I called it loft one. The algebraic version is a little quicker. The, gra the geometric version of establishing loft is a little bit more visual. So for a large perturbation, I'm quite a bit off of theory. Again, you are not responsible for the theory. If you want to challenge your engineering friends to a contest, you're going to win. Um, what else? Uh, as the delta gets smaller, the answer approaches truth with a capital T. It's negative, which means it's sad. Uh, it's a sad face bending concave down uh, on the other side. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. The load is pushing the crown down and the segment on the left is saying, ow, 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 I'm being deformed in a sad fashion. So this is the summary and then we'll jump over to GeoGebra and just quickly recap uh, all of these points uh, in the next video because I don't want your uh, head to hurt. And some of you might not need the next video. So let's just go through the summary. Uh, delta, when you are seeking a moment, is a change in angle between segments on either side of the cut. Don't worry about radians. It knows that you want radians. Uh, everything must be rigid. So you're always intersecting two circles based on known points that are unambiguous. So what is your etude or your study? Recreate this structure. You can have one elbow. You can have two elbows if you want. Doesn't matter. Just make sure the hinge is in the, at the crown and that the two ends are pinned. Uh, pick a load, anything you want. Pick a bending moment, anything you want. You can do it anywhere you want. I suggest you do it at the elbow if you're, uh, um, it, it's a great number. It's not just because it's easier. It's something that we want as designers. We want to know what we're designing that elbow at our factory. So we need to know the bending in there. So I suggest that, but it doesn't have to be there. You can do it anywhere you want. Same routine as before, create a summary document in a single PDF, upload it, have fun with it. It's going to be just great. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, see you next time uh, on the GeoGebra version of this. Otherwise, if you don't need it, you could skip it, go to the, the next lesson. Great. Thanks.